welcome to Actual Tech Media's EcoCast. Today's topic is supercharging public sector and education technology and security. My name is Jess Steinbach. I'm with Actual Tech Media, and I am thrilled to be your moderator for this important conversation and, and a deep dive into the opportunities, the restrictions, the needs that are specific to public sector and educational organizations. I love days like today where we get to bring together a community, maybe with a bit of a shared interest or a common experience, and talk about the things that are really important to each one of you. And that is exactly what we're going to be digging into today on the EcoCast. All the things that are on your mind, on your to-do list, we're going to Talk about the things that are maybe getting you excited, maybe the things that are keeping you up at night, all the joys and the stress, the opportunities and the risks, and best of all, the ways that you can power up your existing technology and security programs to get the most out of these technologies, get the most out of where you've invested and the infrastructure you've built, and keep doing all of the awesome work that you all do every day. And we are not alone in the fun today. We're going to have two incredible teams here with us. We're going to be chatting with Rubrik and Sophos. They've brought along their top experts in tech and security for public sector and education. So it is going to be an absolutely fascinating day. I do not want to take a single minute away from our speakers. So we're just going to zip through some of the housekeeping info and get things rolling. Okay, so I'm going to start by taking a little bit of a tour of your audience console. So first up, if you can all come along with me on this journey, find that questions tab on your screen. Find that questions window. If you haven't already said hi, now is a great time to reach out. Give a wave to the other members of the Actual Tech Media community. We love seeing you all connect and hearing how your days are going. So let us know uh, and, and give us a wave there. Now throughout the webinar today, that questions tab is also a great place to reach out to the Actual Tech Media crew directly. So if you're having any tech issues or you need a little hand with something. Now I do want to remind you that a browser refresh is going to clear out any of those little tech gremlins. But if that doesn't work, if the browser refresh has not helped, shoot us a message and we will be there to help. Most importantly though, we want this to be an informative and interactive webinar for you, which means that we want to see all of those technical questions. So throughout today's EcoCast, we hope that you will get engaged, get involved in the, in the conversation, in the discussion, post comments, questions, tips, discussion points, whatever you have in mind, we want to hear from you. So post that all in that tab there. Now not only will we have team members responding to you during the live webinar over live chat and get into some questions and a little bit of a Q&A session there. We also make sure that all of the questions that you ask go to the teams here with us today. And that way the awesome humans from Rubrik and from Sophos can follow up with you and make sure that they are able to expand on some of those answers that are tricky to dig into sometimes on live chat. Uh, and when we have a little bit of time constraints, they will follow up and give you some extended answers as well. So make sure you're getting those questions in. All right, I have two more things I want to point out on your audience console there today. First up is that Twitter button. So you're going to hear all kinds of cool things today. Uh, you know, and, and of course, the public sector and education world is just a fantastic community of humans. As you all know, you're a part of it. So you want to share the info. You want to, you want to spread those good vibes and spread the information. When you hear something awesome or exciting or innovative or interesting, you can use that Twitter button right there on your, on your webinar console right in front of you there. Uh, and the hashtag for today's webinar is going to get automatically added to your post. Now the very last thing before we move on here that I want to point out on your console is the handouts tab. It is right there, right next to the questions tab that we were chatting about a little bit earlier. Now in the handout section, you're going to find some fantastic resources and takeaways from our speakers here today. It is so hard to remember everything that you hear in these sessions because there's so much great information. So make your life easy. Your future self will thank you. Check out those handouts out, download them, save them for later. You can reference back after we wrap up. All right, now if I haven't met you already, as I mentioned at the top, my name's Jess Steinbach. I am with Actual Tech Media, and I'm very happy to be chatting with you all today as a moderator. Uh, and we're go actually going to be joined by my wonderful fellow moderators, Scott Becker and David Davis. They're here on live chat, hanging out throughout the day. So you get the whole, the whole mod squad, as we say here. <laughs> 
<laughs> actual tech. And if that wasn't enough good news, we also have three $500 Amazon gift cards that we're going to be giving away to three lucky winners here today. Now, as a reminder, you do need to be in attendance live during the EcoCast in order to qualify for these prizes. And all winners must meet the actual tech media prize terms and conditions. If you are not sure what those are, no problem. We have them all written down and collected for you, so you don't have to go digging around for that. You can click right into that handout tab that I was telling you about earlier. Scroll down to the bottom. You'll find the full T's and C's waiting for you there, and you can take a little cruise through those if you like. Now, I mentioned this a little bit earlier. I'm going to say it again. The absolute most important thing during the webinar today is that we want to hear from you. We love interacting with you. So again, questions, comments, whatever you've got, send us, uh, send us a message. Now, if you are asking questions throughout the webinar, we are going to collect all the questions asked in each one of our sessions, and we will be choosing the best question asked for each session. So then we will follow up with that best question asked, and they will win a $50 Amazon gift card. Again, that means that even if we don't get to your question during a live Q&A, you are still entered to win. So get those questions in. All right, I'm going to put up a few of the little, I know I said the full T's and C's are in the handouts tab. They are. They're waiting for you there. But here's a few little reminders for you, including the fact that all grand prize winners are required to submit an IRS form W9 to actual tech media. All right, now if you're looking for a great way to give back to your community, you always have the option to donate the value of your prize to one of these selected charities that you can see up on the screen here. Now thanks to generous prize winners on previous actual tech media webinars, thousands of dollars have been donated to these really wonderful organizations. So if you're a lucky winner and you want to get involved, you want to find out more, let us know. We are very happy to have that conversation with you. Now another thing we're happy about here at Actual Tech Media is all of you and getting to connect with you here today. And we want to keep those good vibes going. So please do find us on social media. We would love to connect with you on Twitter. We would love to connect with you on LinkedIn. If you are looking for some content, uh, maybe to follow up on some of the things we've heard about today or to expand in different directions, I'm going to highly, highly recommend that you check out our YouTube channel. Subscribe to that channel. There is new content being added every day, every week. There's new stuff popping up. So please do uh, head over and subscribe and check out those webinars. There is something for everybody there. It is just a really cool, cool place to explore. All right, well, uh, last but not least here, I do want to remind you all that another great way to win a prize and get some you know, good community building vibes going is to refer an industry friend or coworker to the actual Tech Media webinar series. You're going to find a link right there in your Handouts tab, uh, and you actually get automatically redirected at the end of this webinar as well. Now, here's the thing, because I know it's always a little nerve-wracking when you're referring a friend to something like this. So I do want to let you know that we are not going to spam your friends or coworkers. We promise not to do that. I know that everybody's inboxes are really full. So we're just going to send them an invite to a list of upcoming webinars. Now, if they don't respond, we'll send them one little reminder in case life got busy and they just missed the first one. And then that's it. And then we'll back off and, and wait until they uh, have a little bit more free time in their life. Uh, and then both you and your coworker, colleague, or friend could win a $300 Amazon gift card. We actually hold those drawings every month. Every month we're holding those drawings. So make sure you think of somebody awesome and uh, send them an invite to come join us. All right, well, that was all the housekeeping things. We did that nice and quick. Uh, I don't know about you guys, though. I am ready to get into our session. So we're going to get things rolling with one of our favorite experts here today, Brian M. Posey. Now, he's going to introduce himself in just a moment, so I'll uh, let him kind of take that on. But uh, I, as you can see up on the screen here, he is one cool guy. I mean, who doesn't love talking to an astronaut first thing in the morning, astronaut candidate? still pretty cool. Uh, Brian, thank you so much for being here with us to kick off the EcoCast. Your sessions are always so interesting. I can't wait to jump in here. So I'm going to hand the mic right on over to you. Take it away, Brian. Hello, greetings, and welcome. I'm Brian Posey, a 21-time Microsoft MVP and commercial astronaut candidate. And in this keynote address, I want to spend just a few minutes talking about supercharging public sector and education technology and security. So let's go ahead and get started. The idea of supercharging technology and security is really about technology adoption. And as I thought about technology adoption, one of the first things that really came to mind was the 10 laws of cybersecurity risks. Now, that might seem to be an odd place to go with this, but the 10 laws of cybersecurity risk are a list of things that are put out by Microsoft, and it's essentially 10 fundamental truths with regard to cybersecurity. 
And incidentally, there is a 2.0 version of this, and I would highly recommend checking it out. There's a link on the bottom of the slide where you can go to the article that lists these risks. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go over all of these, but the one that really stood out to me with regard to the topic at hand was rule number three, productivity always wins. So what that really means is that your users don't necessarily care about security or about the adoption of new technology. They just want to have the tools to be able to get their jobs done, and they don't want technology getting in their way. So the key to a successful technology rollout is to do it in a way that causes the least possible friction with your end users. In other words, make the secure way the easy way of doing things and present the new technology as something that's going to improve your users' lives rather than as being something that they have to deal with and accommodate whether they like it or not. So that being the case, I wanted to really center my presentation around a five-step plan for technology adoption. Now, this plan works for security product adoption. It works for new technology product adoption. It works for just about anything. At any rate, the five steps are five things that you should consider as you work toward implementing a new technology, particularly in situations in which that new technology is going to replace something that has already been being used throughout your organization. So step number one is to consider why you're doing this in the first place. If you're bringing in a new technology product to replace something that your organization is already using, there has to be some reason why you're doing it. What's your justification behind making this move? Is the new product that you're bringing in more secure? Is it going to enhance user productivity? Is it in response to some sort of regulatory requirement? What's your reason for doing this? Now, as important as it may be to define a reason, it's equally important to come up with a strategy for end-user buy-in. Because, as I mentioned a moment ago, your users don't necessarily care that you're implementing a new technology. They just want to be able to do their jobs, and they want to be able to do their jobs with minimal friction. So, as you're figuring out why it is that you're doing this, you also need to be thinking about this from the end user's perspective, specifically with regard to the question, what's in it for me? What is it that's going to appeal to the end user and make them buy into this technology that you're adopting? Because your lives will be a whole lot easier if you can get users to embrace what it is that you're doing rather than resisting it. The second step in the process is to make sure that you're giving your users a voice. This is a key step that is often overlooked by IT departments, but it's important nonetheless. The idea being that any time that you're making a change to the technology that directly impacts the users, the users are quite naturally going to have concerns. Sometimes those concerns are relatively minor, but other times there are legitimate concerns about how a user is going to be able to do their job going forward. So it's important to give the users an opportunity to voice those concerns. The message from the IT department shouldn't be, hey, this is happening whether you like it or not. The message instead should be something more along the lines of, this is what we want to do, but we want your feedback in this as we move along, just to make sure that this is going to be good for you too. So what's an example of this? Well, suppose for a moment that your organization has been using Microsoft Excel and you're planning on switching to an alternative platform. Well, you may have users in the accounting department who have macros in Excel spreadsheets and they're concerned about those macros not working in whatever platform you're thinking about adopting. Likewise, there may be documents that are stored in a legacy Excel format that simply won't open in that new platform. Those are the types of things that need to be addressed. And you may find that there is an easy workaround for those types of problems, or you may find that the change that you're thinking about is going to have a major adverse impact on the organization and you need to come up with a different strategy. In any case, it's important to make sure that you're giving your users a voice. Step three in the process is to avoid the temptation to rush the deployment. In other words, don't immediately go all in on the deployment of your new technology product. Technology adoption needs to happen in phases. That way you can avoid potential problems along the way. So how might you go about deploying a new technology product? Well, what I would recommend is first of all, assess whether or not the deployment is something that needs to happen immediately. In other words, is it urgent or is it something that you can take your time and do some testing on? If, for example, you've recently had a security breach and the new product is designed to address that breach, well, that's something that I would consider to be urgent and something that you probably want to deploy as quickly as possible. If, on the other hand, you're rolling out a new line of business application or something like that, you can take your time with that and do some testing along the way. So the testing process is going to differ from one organization to the next, but there are some basic steps that you should follow. 
begin by doing some internal testing within the IT department. You might, for example, get some IT employees to install the product on their own machines and try running it and just to make sure that there's no major stability or compatibility issues. Once you've done that, then the next step might be to get a few select power users to install the application and see how they like it. Because your power users are people who generally have a good working knowledge of IT, even if they're not in the IT department, and they're in a really good position to be able to tell you if a product is going to work or if it's got problems. From there, you might move forward to a pilot deployment program. A pilot deployment program is essentially a rolling out of the product on a very, very limited basis. You might choose, for example, a few users in each department to try out the new product. And then once the pilot deployment has been proven successful, then the next phase after that is to do a phased broad implementation across the entire company. Now, depending on the size of the organization, you probably don't want to deploy this new product to everybody all at once, even if the pilot deployment has proven successful. Instead, it's better to roll the product out in phases. And the reason for that is there's a very real chance that problems might surface during the broad implementation that didn't show up during the pilot deployment. And if that happens, you don't want to overwhelm your help desk. So it's good to do a phased approach to the broad implementation. Step four is to give the users time to deal with the new technology adoption. You know, when you're adopting a new technology product, it's easy to think of the technology adoption as high priority, especially when it's security related. But try to avoid the temptation to rush the implementation unless it truly is a, an urgent matter. Instead, give everybody a reasonable amount of time to get used to the new technology and let everybody know well in advance when the final cutover will happen. So what a lot of organizations will do when they're going to be deploying a new technology product that replaces one that the users are already using is that they'll run the two products in parallel for a period of time and they'll give users a date on which they're going to do a final cutover to the new product. And this date might be something that the users are periodically reminded of, whether it's through a countdown timer or email messages that go out from time to time. There's typically some sort of mechanism that lets the users know when that final cutover is going to happen so that it doesn't take anybody by surprise. The fifth and final step in the process is to make sure that you're giving your users the resources that they need to succeed. A simple way of thinking about this is to make sure that you're training your users on the new product and that the users are fully aware of how things are going to change for them. Now, having said that, it's equally important to make sure that the training is effective and that it provides a way to have users to get their questions answered. I've seen a number of examples where users are simply pointed to a YouTube video or to a similar resource, and that counts as the training. While video-based training certainly does have its place, when you're implementing a new technology product and it's something that the users are going to use day to day, it may be helpful to provide the users with a lab environment where they can actually try out the product in a safe environment. And it's even better if you can provide some sort of instructor-led training so that the users have the opportunity to get their questions answered along the way, because a video may or may not necessarily address the questions that the users have. So with that said, I'm just about out of time. I'm Brian Posey. Thanks for watching. Oh, thank you, Brian. Always such a pleasure to start out uh, a conversation with some words from you. I, I was really um, uh, resonating with, especially that phased approach thing. I think so often we just want to jump in from start to the finish line. <laughs> and and uh, especially when we're dealing with a lot of different, you know, compliance and regulatory issues and, and you know, sometimes limited resources, uh, whether that's team power or, or budget, um, taking a phased approach makes things feel not only more manageable, but make sure that you can stop and evaluate along the way. Um, anyways, that, that was sticking in my brain a little bit there. Uh, well, some of you are already uh, hearing, or excuse me, sorry, I was just noticing somebody said they can't hear me. I, I hope you can all hear me right now. I'm, I'm hearing from someone that they can't. Kenneth, can you, can you hear me okay now? Uh, we, we have a, a poll up on the screen for you here, if, if you are able to hear me. Uh, checking in to see, we want to ask you a few questions about ransomware. Now, I want to give you a little context to these polls. I'm going to ask you just a few questions about ransomware, and I'd like you to answer as honestly as you're uh, comfortable answering. Uh, we're just collecting this right now. We're, we're doing a little bit of uh, data and, and looking at a few kind of ways that our audience is feeling about ransomware right now in terms of their organizations. Um, so this is 
is purely for uh, ransomware.org and for um, uh, you know to share with all of you. So we won't be sharing any specifics of a specific organization connected to a specific name. Uh, so please do feel free to to answer <laughs> honestly. Uh, and what we're wondering here is, do you believe your organization is ready for a ransomware attack? Yes, no, maybe, or oh no 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 no. All right, so let us know what you think about that. I'm going to move things along here. Okay, do you believe ransomware will continue to be a serious threat in 2023? That's a big question, isn't it? And there's a bunch of trend reports coming out right now. Uh, a lot of organizations are putting together their 2022 threat analysis. Um, so this is the time to be asking this question. Do we believe that ransomware will continue to be a serious threat in 2023? Just to give you an idea, right now we are all about 100% saying yes. So um, yeah, and, and maybe a few people kind of saying you're, you're not totally sure, which is, uh, you know, a good, a good sort of um, thing to be aware of is that we, we never really know what's going to come in the future, do we? But I think most of us are in agreement that this is probably at least going to be on the radar as a serious threat. Okay, compared to 2022, do you think your company is more or less likely to be a target of ransomware attacks this year? More likely, less likely, or I think the threat's going to stay the same? More likely, less likely, or I think it'll stay the same. Uh, so right off the hop, quite a few of you saying that you think it's going to stay the same, a few people saying more likely. Let us know what you think. There's no wrong answers or right answers here. This is not a, a training quiz of any kind. We're just sort of curious where you think the landscape is going. Are, are you uh, more likely or less likely to be the target of a ransomware attack? Okay, I'm going to move things along. Oh, and Paul Hurst is adding in, especially with AI-based attacks. That's a great point. Yep. Lots of uh, fun innovations <laughs> coming on on all sides, unfortunately, threat actors and those of us uh, working against that. Uh, okay, so let's talk about how long you think it would uh, you would estimate that it would take your organization to bounce back from a ransomware attack. Are we talking hours? Are we talking days? Are we talking weeks? Are we talking months? Or hey, that terrible terrible feeling we would be up a creek without a paddle, no recovery from that. Hours, days, weeks, months, or just pack it up. Pack it up and go. Uh, so what do you think would be your timeline for recovery? And, you know, this is an interesting one. If you haven't spent some time thinking about this at your organization, uh, and I'm sure most of you have, it would be really interesting to ask some of these questions of uh, the folks in your team. You know, we and, and, and when I say team, I'm also going to expand that beyond anyone who's in IT or tech with you. Um, so if you ask somebody in, you know, HR, if you ask somebody in um, sales, uh, if they know what would happen when there's a ransomware attack, and maybe not everyone does need to know, maybe not everyone does, uh, but it would be interesting to know if, you know, the entire organization is as aware as the folks in this room, this virtual room together are, um, and actually that's going to feed us into uh, our next question here. Do you think those in your organization are well aware of the threat? Yes, very well. Most are aware. It's 50-50. Few are aware. Almost nobody cares or no awareness whatsoever. We are all doomed. Ugh. Okay, yep. That's, hey, that's a feeling some of us have. And I'm curious, you know, if anyone has any thoughts about that, do you think it is important? I mean, I, it is something that affects the entire organization and downtime would affect the entire organization. And of course, we all know social engineering and the human element. Um, but even just awareness of what ransomware is, awareness of uh, what would happen in an event where you, you had to, you know, shut down and recover or, or switch, you know, go to backup. Um, I'm curious if you all think that uh, everyone in your organization needs to be aware. And if so, are they? All right, well, we've got one more question for you all, and I think a lot of you will recognize this poll. Uh, this just gives us an idea of your urgency. So are you thinking, you know, in terms of a time frame for adding new or, or potentially updating some of your existing uh, IT solutions at your company, what's your time frame? Uh, zero to six months, six to 12 months, 12 to 24 months, or not sure? Um, and I, I'm just going to, I'm noticing a few uh, things coming in in the chat. Uh, and, you know, one of the, the comments we had here is that some of these questions are hard to answer. I agree. Yeah, yeah, they are hard to answer. Maybe because you're not entirely sure, or you don't have the full purview, or because they're complex, they're yes, maybes, or if this, then this, or, you know, this, but not that. Uh, I get it. These are, these are complex situations. Um, another comment here, Michael saying, ours is way too optimistic. Weeks means we're doing it wrong. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so somewhere somewhere in the middle um, it's a it's a really interesting and these are tough questions tough questions which is of course why we are all here today is to talk about 
uh, some of these topics and dig in a little bit. And I really appreciate all of you taking some time to answer those polls for us as well. As I said, we're collecting as much data as we can from the community here, and then uh, we will kind of consolidate and bring that back to you and let you all know where you are all at, you know, and what you're all uh, doing to, as you think about these uh, ransomware threats over this upcoming year. All right, well with that, I think it's about time that we get into our sessions here. We've all waited long enough and we have a great, great, great start to our EcoCast lined up for you all. To kick off our discussion today, we're gonna to be chatting with an expert from the awesome folks at Rubrik, as you can see on the screen there. I am so happy to introduce you all or probably reintroduce you all to a familiar voice here on the EcoCast and that is Shrija Mohar, our inside sales engineer at Rubrik. Shrija, thank you so much for being here again to, to get us started here today on the EcoCast. Uh, I know that you have a lot of information to cover for us today, so I am going to hand the mic right on over to you. Take it away, Shreja. Thank you so much for having me. Perfect. So I hope everyone is having a wonderful Wednesday so far. I'm here to discuss um, oh, securing or supporting, improving, and securing education and government IT in the cloud. Um, so starting off with securing your Microsoft 365 data with Rubrik. Um, as you know, Microsoft 365 encapsulates many data sources like SharePoint sites, Exchange, including mailboxes, calendars, um, and contacts, as well as Microsoft Teams and OneDrive. Um, so M365 is a SaaS solution, but as with many cloud services, the data and information is the responsibility of the customer. So the customer is responsible for protecting that data at the end of the day. And Microsoft's real focus is, in, is on providing that infrastructure and availability of these applications. So many people ask, you know, why bother with backup? Well, in fact, Microsoft will tell you right within your services agreement that they recommend backing up your content and data with third-party apps and services as best practice for securing your data, because they know that data loss happens. So, um, oops, sorry. Data loss happens no matter where that data lives, whether through access to deletion or something more malicious like hackers and ransomware, and recovery is the user's responsibility. So the Microsoft 365 protection paradox, um, as you can see with all these percentages and statistics, um, increased business critical data has um, increased drastically over the years, um, but there's limited last line of defense um, 25% of customers and organizations and companies aren't utilizing any backup solutions for their M365 environment. And all of this pertinent information is not backed up. Um, also, a lot of um, companies as well are relying on their cloud vendor, which I'll touch on why that can be an issue later on. Um, so yeah, we provided a solution that can protect your information and ensure that this pertinent data is available. So you may be asking, why does M365 need to be protected? Well, um, the four key reasons is that accidental deletions happen all the time with users or employees. Um, and then there can also be malicious insiders. So if an employee is terminated, for example, um, and attempting to delete confidential data before they depart, um, that can be a major issue and disaster for an organization or company. Um, but the main reason is also malware or ransomware attacks. So M365 has become a top target. Um, employees unintentionally clicking something they shouldn't have, like phishing attempts, or downloading infected files and accidentally leaking usernames and passwords to sites they thought they could trust but are um, end up not being secure could raise a major issue for organizations. Um, and then the complexities and gaps in data retention, uh, Microsoft 365 retention policies are difficult to keep up with, let alone manage. And for instance, um, Exchange Online has a 30-day retention policy after which data will permanently be deleted. Um, for OneDrive, it's around 93 days, and then for deactivated employees, it's only 30 days for their OneDrive um, account. Um, for SharePoint, again, it's around 93 days, and not only is this complex to manage, but you can't always be sure if your data is recoverable. And any gap in data retention can result in data being permanently lost and unrecoverable, and with the legal requirements, compliance requirements, 
and access um, regulations varying between industries and countries, these gaps can result in major compliance violations. So um, as you all probably know, Microsoft 365 has seen exponential growth during the COVID pandemic. Um, there is sudden pressure pressure on businesses to go remote and sudden pressure on IT teams to enable their organizations to do so safely and efficiently. So it's no surprise that apps like Microsoft Teams saw 500% growth in daily active users over the course of just one year. Um, so you think, you know, new IT landscape with more critical data being stored on remote devices, new data management imperatives, right? But when you look at most organizations, um, that are protecting this data, you see that not many of them are backing it up. Um, in fact, you can see that nearly half the people are relying entirely on their cloud vendor for backup and recovery. And I'll tell you why that is worrying on the next slide. So we have seen instances where Microsoft 365 has suffered ransomware, um, malicious deletion of files, as well as many incidences where there's inadvertent deletion of business critical data that unfortunately um, was unrecoverable. So we've seen data that says around 71% of 365 users have experienced an account takeover. So what that is is a type of identity theft or fraud um, where malicious third, party, uh, malicious third party gains access to a user account credentials, something of that sort. And then 81% of users have experienced an email breach. So it's very common um, nowadays. And analysts are also telling us that 74% of Microsoft 365 users have identified the issue and are evaluating the need for third-party data protection. So unfortunately, if your primary use case is backup and recovery, that's not what Microsoft's native tools were built for. Um, so if you're utilizing these native tools, um, they can be helpful for some compliance use cases, but they're not real backup. Um, they store data directly on the live production environment with no actual backup to recover from. So if something happens to that production environment, um, the data will be gone. Um, and even if there is a retained file that you can bring up, you're limited to file by file restores and have to go through a tedious, you know, 10 step restore process for each file. Um, and then addition, in addition to the cost of the time you're spending to locate this data, restore this data, or navigate the Microsoft Compliance Center um, where all these tools reside. These tools really aren't free. So depending on what license you have, you may need to upgrade to even get access. And that doesn't cover the storage consumed by retaining this data in the Microsoft 365 environment. And it can end up being 200 times more expensive than any solution that leverages lower cost blob storage. So uh, what does Microsoft actually provide? Um, well, they have that recycle bin capability, so that 30 to 90 days of retention dependent on the application um, between Teams, SharePoint, OneDrive, um, Exchange, et cetera. And then they also do have a litigation hold capability, so this will preserve data for legal requirements. Um, users can still make changes and delete items, but unaltered copies will be preserved. And then this retains all those contents and copies, um, including the deleted items from the original versions of modified items. And lastly, they do also provide retention policies to prevent the permanent deletion of data such as files, documents, or emails, um, and ensure that that information is stored for a mandated period of time. Next, here's just a um, slide that you can see. There's a lot of steps. Um, you have to go through when utilizing the Microsoft key discovery capability can be tedious and very time consuming. So what we did here at Rubrics is uh, Microsoft and Rubrics together provide a complete protection of your M365 environment. We actually have a wonderful partnership with Microsoft and are one of their largest customers. Um, so Microsoft will provide that security, compliance, and availability piece, and then Rubrics will provide um, the recovery capabilities. So actually the Microsoft team collaborated with our engineering team over here at Rubrics to create this solution due to our you know, wonderful partnership with them. And we do have um, custom abilities 
and capabilities um, within our solution that other vendors do not um, possess. So rubric M365 protection. So what rubric offers is a 100% SAS data management solution that's built for backup and recovery. Um, we provide secure offline backups across Exchange Online, OneDrive, SharePoint, and Teams um, so that you can ensure that critical data is available in the event of data loss and whether that, that's accidental deletions or you know, a more malicious event. And it's really easy to get started. So Microsoft 365 Protection is delivered as a service via our Polaris platform. Um, zero infrastructure is required, and it takes two steps to get set up um, so you don't have to worry about any upgrades, hardware maintenance, or any refreshes. Um, it takes a few clicks to authorize rubrics with your Microsoft 365 environment, and you can get set up within minutes. Um, it's also really easy to configure, so you don't need to pass any credentials to us. All you need to do is authorize rubrics to connect to your Microsoft 365 environment, and we'll establish a secure connection automatically. And to configure, to configure SLA policies, aka um, what we call retention policies, all you need to do is state how often you want things to be backed up, so the frequency of the backup, as well as how long you need to keep your data, so the retention of those backups. And Rubrik will take care of everything else on the back end. So the benefits of Rubrik M365 protection, you can use our SLA policy engine to automate protection at scale for any number of users. Um, and you don't have to spend hours of manual effort trying to restore emails or OneDrive folders or files, et cetera. With Rubrik, um, recovery and resource take three easy clicks. So you can also avoid having to restore unnecessary data by searching and recovering the exact files or folders you need um, or restore in full to any location of your choice. You can also configure role-based access controls to enable um, other users access for self-service resources as well. And finally, the real rubric advantage is that you can do this all seamlessly from a, the same management console as, as the rest of your environment. So no need to log into separate applications for monitoring um, or for your team to learn an additional tool. You can extend the same simplicity for on-prem protection um, to your Microsoft 365 environment. So Rubrik radically simplifies and speed up, speeds up this recovery process, as you can see here. Um, a quick three-step process. So simply all you have to do is utilize Rubrik's predictive search to locate that email or file that you want to recover, um, select the file along with any others, and then um, select the restore target. So, just in three easy steps, your data is back where it belongs and your team is back to spending time on more strategic projects and pertinent things. So the rubric solution provides backup and restore for all M365 applications with integrations capable of restoration at the granular level. Um, so yes, our M365 solution is air gap. We have a logically air gap solution for our M365 piece. Um, and you do have the capability to restore at the granular level. So let's say you wanted to find a specific file in a folder in your OneDrive. All you have to do is use that predictive search, um, search the name of that file, and then you can easily recover it to the original user. Um, another user, if that employee, let's say, left the company or um, download it as a zip file. And then we do um, provide backup and restoration options options for all M365 applications uh, jacked. And then, so we need some setting changes and teams to enable. Um, no, you do not need to change any of the setting um, settings within your team's application to enable rubric implementation. So this will back up any of the chats that multiple users can um, be a part of, but no, the private messages will be um, backed up just because that is a privacy um, regulation that Microsoft has, so we can't overcome that. But um, no need to change any of the settings <clears throat> within your team's app. That's Reading nice, especially because, yeah, we do have a oh. lot of teams that are on the smaller side. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, and yeah, sorry, we just got a, a new question in. Uh, 
And, oh, you know what? Actually, one of the ones I, I wanted to see if you had any thoughts on, you know, Patrick had uh, made a comment about the PEBCAC, the <laughs> problem exists between the keyboard and chair. Um, and I was chatting with a member of your team yesterday, actually, on a, on a tech talk um, about zero trust security, which I should be on demand shortly. And I highly recommend everyone check out the rubric tech talk on, on uh, zero trust security. Um, and it, just out of curiosity, I'm wondering uh, if what what is the support at Rubric like in terms of it sounds like rollout and implementation is pretty simple. Um, and uh, is there any help in in terms of uh, training, education, and and ways that uh, maybe from a, a change management <laughs> perspective, these uh, yeah. these teams can implement this type of tool? Yeah. So um, for our M365 piece specifically, it's very easy to set up and manage, and we can guide you through that process as well. Um, we also do have a free 30-day trial on our website that you can easily sign up for if you want to test out the solution yourself um, and see it in action. Um, we do have Rubric University available for any customers if they do have any questions about any of our offerings or how to implement or do any tasks within our interface. Um, and then our support team over here at Rubric is always available as well. So we actually have a CSAT rating of 98.6%. Our customers are really satisfied with the level of support we can provide. Um, mm -hmm. And we're always here to help with any questions or concerns about Rubric itself, the solution, um, any workloads, any field jobs, anything of that sort. That's huge, especially since, as we chatted about earlier, there's a, a shortage of uh, people with some of these specific skills. So if, if the uh, teams in question here are able to rely on that support from Rubik, Rubik that makes a big difference. Um, Deb here is wondering if you could speak a little bit to some of the uniques um, at Rubrik and, and what you would say sort of the top, <laughs> top <laughs> uniques are for your solution. Yeah, so um, the main unique differentiator, in my opinion, for our M365 piece is our service health API we're utilizing to ensure that your M365 environment is online and is functioning properly, and it will notify you um, if there is any sort of outage or if anything is offline. Um, we also do allow um, for an auto retry mechanism for any failed backups um, and then switch between multiple APIs to ensure that your backups are succeeding. Um, we have a wonderful audit and compliance piece um, that you can easily view any reports from to see if your daily tasks are succeeding, all the backups are healthy and successful. Um, and you don't even have to log into the interface. Let's say you are um, swamped that day, you have a lot of meetings, you don't have time to um, check on those backups. You can actually have those reports sent out to your email or your team's email on a daily or weekly basis to ensure that you have all the information you need, um, but you don't have to spend time logging in. Um, we also do integrate with various different multi-factor authenticators um, like Duo, Okta, RSA Secure ID, anything that is SAML 2.0 compliant. Um, and then we allow for time-based one-time passcodes natively for any local or AP users to ensure all of the logins to your backup environment are safe and secure. So those are <laughs> some capabilities, but we have a lot more to highlight too. And if you guys are ever interested, uh, please reach out. I would love to um, have a great conversation with you. Those are a lot of really good uniques there. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> a lot of a lot of reasons to reach out to Rubric, uh, and and I uh, I want to uh, I guess follow up on that. Um, if you sort of had one thing that you would want everyone to to walk away from this conversation, kind of thinking about or asking themselves. Um, what what would that be? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say, is your data environment not even just the M365 piece or your cloud workloads? Is it secure? Is there um, a level of security from ransomware attackers? Um, is are you utilizing the right measures? Um, there. Very important things, especially nowadays since ransomware attacks are occurring all the time. Um, mm. And cyber insurance requirements are rising. And that's really where Rubrik steps in and um, has cyber resiliency at the top of our minds because um, there's so many things to implement, so many different solutions, so many components. And we wanted to simplify that process. So I would love everyone to you know think about what their security measures are today. You know, that's a really great point. I think we, we have this tendency now to just start um, collecting 
security tools and solutions without necessarily putting the forethought in. And then, you know, we talk about these Frankenstein solutions uh, <laughs> and, uh, and it can get really out of hand really fast. So, you know, it's nice to work with a company or um, like rubric that has so many different tools within one that you can kind of um, consolidate a little bit and not, not feel so much like you're, <laughs> you're in a, in a Frankenstein. Um, yeah. Well, I hope we did get to cover everything that you wanted to today. You know, if, if anyone does have any further questions and wants to dig in a bit more uh, into cloud, I, I highly recommend uh, reaching out. Is there any first step? You know, you've mentioned getting in touch with yourself. What do you suggest is that first move if somebody's interested in getting involved with Rubric? Yeah, you guys, um, anyone can check out our website. You can request a meeting, um, a POC. Um, you can see our products and actions and what we have to offer. Um, and yeah, so you can reach out on LinkedIn to anyone at Rubric and we'd be more than happy to help. Yep, I can attest you guys have an, an awesome team. Always a pleasure to chat with you. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us here today, Shuja. This has just been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much. I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of the week. All right, well, and we've got a poll up for you all. Um, what we want to know is what additional information would you like about the Rubric solution? So I saw a few of you and actually one or two of you asked for customer case studies. So this is a great way to get that. You just click on your customer case study option right there and Rubrik will send you exactly what you're looking for. Um, there's also a couple other great options there, data sheets, tech white papers, uh, pricing information, I want a demo. Um, so let Rubrik know how they can follow up with you and then that way obviously you, can, you should and, and I'm sure will do lots of research on your own. But why not make at least one step of this process a little bit easier by just clicking on that poll there uh, and letting Rubrik know that, that this is the information that you want. Uh, and I see, Satyam, yes, I see that you would like a case study as well. Feel free to click on that poll. Also, we will log uh, all of these questions. I'll make sure that any of the questions asked are getting over to Rubrik. So uh, that does go for everyone else in the audience as well that asked a question that we did not get to with Shrija. If you asked a question that we did not get to, we will make sure that all of your questions go to Rubrik. So you'll get some follow-ups uh, and some answers after we wrap. Now, while you're clicking on that poll, I'm also going to remind you to head on over to that handouts tab and download the data sheet from Rubrik. This is a Rubrik for Cloud Native Protection. So it's looking at how to automate backup and rapid recovery at scale. How important is that across your hybrid and multi-cloud environments? Whatever kind of a, a cloud infrastructure you've got, uh, they can help you with that automated backup and rapid recovery. It is a very interesting read. Uh, it's going to explore you know, some of these challenges that I'm guessing a lot of you are, are probably facing right now, and that is that maybe as your cloud environment expands, you might be finding that your data is now a little bit fragmented. So you might have that across you know, a hybrid and a multi-cloud infrastructure that makes it hard to kind of manage uh, and, and I, certainly harder to protect. Uh, so if, you're, if that's something that you find yourself struggling with or maybe that you think is on the horizon as you uh, scale and expand, this is a great data sheet for you. So be sure to click download and read later. Uh, while you're downloading that and answering the poll, I think it's about time that we did a prize giveaway. So we are going to give away a $500 Amazon gift card. I'll remind you one more time that you do need to be live here present at the Ecocast uh, in order to get that $500 Amazon gift card. And our very first winner of the day is Gina Karasek of Michigan. Gina Karasek of Michigan, you have won a $500 Amazon gift card. As always, we will be in touch about claiming your prize after we wrap today. Now don't forget, there's still two more chances to win one of those gift cards, plus the best question question gift card from each session. We look at those after we wrap. So keep those questions coming in. Okay. But for now, I think it's time that we keep zipping right along uh, in our EcoCast because we have one more awesome presentation lined up for you all. Uh, and this one is going to be absolutely info packed. Okay, I'm very excited to introduce you all to our next speaker and expert uh, who has a really exciting presentation lined up for us all. Uh, we're going to be hearing from Matt Hickey, Senior Director of Sales Engineering at Sophos. Now, Matt, I know that you have uh, just an absolute ton of info to cover, but before you jump in, what I want to let everyone in the audience know is that Matt is going to be talking to us today about the uh, a report from Sophos that is actually in your handouts tab right now. Uh, so you can definitely snag that and read it in, in its entirety later. But if you're 
interested in kind of following along as Matt kind of speaks uh, speaks to it throughout his presentation, um, you can certainly do that. So grab that uh, that handout in uh, the Sophos link in your handouts tab. And with that said, Matt, I will hand the mic right on over to you. Take it away. Hello, my name is Matthew Hickey. And in today's discussion, we're going to talk about the maturing criminal marketplaces presenting new challenges for the public sector defenders. The data presented today comes directly from the SOFOS 2023 threat report. Every year, the cybersecurity industry tends to look back at the end of the year and pronounce the past 12 months as the most consequential time in the history of the industry. While 2022 hasn't had a branded event the likes of the Stucknecks, the WannaCry, or the Colonial Pipeline cyber attack, it unfortunately earned its place in the annals of cyber history as a war erupted in Europe. And we saw an uptick in nation-state-sponsored activity. With the war-disrupting factors of cyber criminals that span both Russia and Ukraine, China has been making dramatic moves of their own. So it appears that 2022, all pretense has been thrown into the wind as the two largest cybersecurity threats flex their muscles. The Sophos 2023 threat report is the first threat report that was published by our Sophos XOPS team. The Sophos XOPS team is a cross operational unit that links three established teams of cybersecurity experts at Sophos, our Sophos labs, which has been doing this type of work for 35 plus years that Sophos has been in existence. Our Sophos SecOps teams, which is part of our MDR rapid response and incident response organization, and our Sophos AI, which is, a, which is a collection of our data scientists that are working on very exciting projects. This also includes more than 500 security experts worldwide. And this is what 35 plus years of being one of the thought leaders in the most competitive IT vertical looks like. When we talk about SecOps, we are referring to our MDR SecOps analyst. This is a team that work on our managed detection and response team and services more than 12,000 customers. It includes our rapid response team, which is our break glass in case of emergency service for active attacks and breaches, which companies have been leveraging to help them on the worst days of their career. Sophos Labs, which is the brains behind all of our solutions, and security, question, security professionals. The question I usually get from most of our larger customers is do we interact with, the, with other security vendors sources? And of course we do. We have back channels with other orgs, both private and public, to share critical information of what we are seeing in the wild. In addition, we even offer our threat feed to large organizations via OEM agreements. And then of course our Sophos data science team. They develop an insights and advanced ML models, automation detection for all of our MDR and Sophos products. You can check out some of their exciting projects on our microsite at ai.sophos.com. So before we de delve into this conversation today, what, what we'll talk about the Sophos 2023 threat report is this covers developments and trends in ransomware, the crime as a service industry, credential threat ecosystem, attack tools, crypto mining, mobile malware, and more. And what we want to do is kind of show you the key trends. So these are the key trends we saw this past year that we see continuing through 2023. And ransomware continues to be one of the greatest cyber threats to organizations with adversaries innovating attack tactics and extortion techniques. Now, the definition of a trend is a general direction in which something is developing or changing. And if you've been an avid reader of the Sophos Threat Report over the years, you, ransomware has been a number one threat for a number of years now. So calling it a trend is is probably inaccurate, but the trend is actually how this is evolving. And we're going to dig deeper into every one of these uh, trends moving forward in the conversation today. The cyber crime as a service industry has reached a new level of commercialization and commodification, removing many entry barriers for those interested in cyber crime and putting advanced threat tactics in the hands of nearly any criminal. Now the entire attack chain is now available as a service. The demand for info stealers and stolen credentials grows, as do their potential users. Stolen credentials now offer numerous ways to infiltrate targeted networks. Long gone are the days that you're doing dumpster diving or looking for passwords written down somewhere within with, within someone's desk. You'll be able to easily provide this or give this information by leveraging one of these services. As I mentioned in the precursor, the war in Ukraine has led to a shakeup of criminal alliances and a reorganization of the ransomware landscape. Ukrainians and Russians have long been partners in crime, particularly when it comes to ransomware. 
And as the war broke out, certain gangs fell apart thanks to nationalism. And we'll dig a little bit deeper into this as well. Cyber criminals continue to exploit legitimate executables and increasingly utilize living off the land binaries to launch attacks, including ransomware. Using legitimate security tools for bad ends remains popular, especially among ransomware groups. If we take a look at an additional trend here, with the devaluation of the most popular cryptocurrencies, crypto mining has been on the decline. So this one might not shock you, but with all the, the collapse of, of Bitcoin, uh, crypto mining is less lucrative. So we we're seeing this as less of something, move, uh, something less uh, to worry about in moving forward. And mobile devices are the center of a burgeoning new types of crime, and both Android and iOS devices are affected. This is a trend that is actually a holdover from the 2022 report. iOS users are not immune anymore, and attackers, attackers have found a way to bypass the Apple Store security policy. iOS users become targets for malicious advertising campaigns and directly download apps with hidden subscription fees, malware, or both. So let's dig a little bit deeper into these key trends. As I said before, ransomware remains one of the greatest cyber crime threats to organizations. And what's happening is that they're not just targeting Linux or Windows anymore, but including Linux as, this, as well. And this really complicates matters for defenders, since most ransomware defense focuses just on Windows. They're also using newer programming languages like Rust and Go to better evade detection and deliver payloads. We began seeing a trend with the with Red Alert or the variant N13V, which encrypts both Windows and Linux ESX servers. Our researchers have noticed the LockBit variant targeting ESX servers. Why, you may ask? These EXS, ESX hypervisors that have capability of hosting hundreds of servers, you imagine the impact of an organization if they could hold one of these captive. Also, some ransomware groups have embraced the use of new programming language in an effect to uh, make detection more difficult, to make the ransomware executable more easily compiled to run over different operating systems. The Rust programming language has been adopted by the developers of both the Black Hat and Hive ransomware. And when it comes to delivering and spreading their malware, ransomware operators continue to evolve. This includes abusing benign applications and legitimate security tools. And they're developing a more innovative extortion methods, you know, selling stolen data with the subscription model, auctioning off stolen data to the highest criminal bidder, and even offering victims a chance to conceal the fact that they have been breached. So the trend of 2021 continued as we saw the ransomware operators move from holding data hostage to extortion with the release of this data. These threat actors are functioning like a legitimate software service offering bun bug bounty programs, menu of service offerings. So when it like LockBit specifically, new bug bounty program offers rewards between $1,000 to 1 million for a variety of activities, from finding bugs in its malware to ideas for improving operations. LockBit also offers its victims the chance to purchase or destroy stolen data or extend the time until data is leaked. So they're ve being very flexible now with this ransomware type of attacks. And so during the first 10 months of 2022, the most prevalent ransomware encountered by Sophos Rapid Response Team, was our SEC DevOps team, was LockBit, followed by Black Hat. But by no means is the most prevalent single ransomware seen, uh, of course, was Black Hat. And, um, but that, keep in mind, the other category accounted for over one-fifth of the families noted, indicating that ransomware landscape is by no means limited to just a few high-profile families. As we said, cybercrime achieves a new level of commercialization and commodification, and this is taking the whole attack chain and selling it as a service. More and more cyber criminal gangs are taking a cue from the software industry and following an as-a-service model to scale their services to industrial levels. We refer to them as the naughty nine. They refer to the entire kill chain as a service, from access as a service, think of this as a dumpster diving without the stench, to scanning as a service, to scamming as a service. And we could go down the list because uh, we're all also familiar as ransomware as a service, but also vishing as a service as, as info stealing services too. Every step of the attack chain is now available. If you have been a frequent reader of the past Sopo Threat reports, we've been following the ransomware as a service industry closely, but it's just not the ransomware as a service, but all aspects of the cybercrime that's available as a service. This includes older, more standard fares, such as malware and phishing kits, too, which attackers are now marketing more aggressively via the as-a-service business model. This also includes newer services, such as OPSEC as a service, designed to help criminals hide things like cobalt strike infections and scanning as a service vulnerabilities to give you a list of 
uh, exploitable vulnerabilities on computer networks. And it's putting tools and tactics that once rested solely in the hands of the most sophisticated actors in the hands of everyone. These organizations are getting more sophisticated and operating as legitimate companies. More marketplaces are using professionally designed graphics and maintaining help wanted pages with dedicated recruiting staffs. Criminals can now pay to advertise their service. Job seekers can post summaries of their qualification skills. This is kind of the LinkedIn for bad people. As I mentioned before, the demand for info stealers and stolen credentials continues to grow. Stolen credentials offer numerous ways to infiltrate targeted networks. Certain credentials such as session cookies can even be used to bypass multi-factor authentication, and they pave way for existing cyber criminals to expand the crime sprees beyond ransomware. All of this data has been compiled by our SOPOS XOPS team. This is a byproduct of a large this is a byproduct of our large product and services portfolio and highlights the benefits of partnering for a company like Sophos that offers a unique perspective across the threat landscape. Finally, the InfoStealer ecosystem is very aware that defenders are ingesting in its doings and in true form, see this as an opportunity for profit. We found this on an underground, underground forum where uh, it sought to monetize white half efforts to scrape their forums by offering $2,000 for an annual subscription for unpeated data collection access. So it's they're, what they're doing is now opening up their services to people that are trying to defend against it as well, opening up another stream of revenue. So they, they have no shame. I guess I, if we want to talk about a theme of this report, it really comes down to this as well. This has been the most significant event to affect really the world this year, but cybersecurity or the cybersecurity industry specifically. And it really transforms the threat landscape. Uh, first of all, as we saw during the, the COVID epi the COVID pandemic, people were very opportunistic to take advantage of this time as well. And then we saw this too as scammers sent out fake charity emails requesting international donations while hundreds of fake charity websites popped up. In one notable campaign, the Emotet malware group used malicious Word documents with titles mimicking Russian propaganda to spread their mal malware. As for state-level cyber attacks outside of Ukraine's borders, uh, at the publishing of this report, uh, we could only attribute one high-profile incident was the Viasat attack, which affected satellite services for, Ukrainian, for Ukrainians, but also affected customers in Europe before the invasion began. It's firmly credited by officials as, the, as Russia's work. But you see here with the bar chart, Ukraine scams uh, as a percentage of daily spam volume spiked in March of 2022. As we saw this, we saw the actual the cyber the cybercrime landscape has shifted because the Ukrainians and the Russians have long been partners in literal crime, and as the war broke out, the gangs fell apart to nationalism. What's interesting is that this led to some. Uh, interesting backstabbing between these groups and led to the Conti leaks, which basically was a dump of chat logs from the ransomware group. So what this gives us the capability to uh, what this gives us capability is that they really opened the playbook of the tactics and techniques used by these groups. Most spectacular divisions between the Russian and Ukrainian members of ransomware gangs and their affiliates may have led to the information of Conti leaks, a dump of the chat logs, as I mentioned, in a short-lived Twitter account called Trickbot Leaks that docked. Um, all the alleged members of TrickBot, Conti, Mazo, all those big ransomware groups that were out there. Uh, but these these victories were short lived, as political events have made international cooperation to tackle ransomware more difficult. Um, and of course, attackers turned to legitimate executables and living off the land binders to launch attacks. So basically, what this what means is that we're using legitimate security tools for bad ends remains popular. These groups often utilize pirate copies of tools like Metasploit Pro, uh, Pro um, purchased on underground forums. Now, Cobalt Strike is still one of the most frequently abused security tools, and it played a role in 47% of the customer incidents that we handled this past year in 2022. So that was a, a – It's if you're not familiar with Cobalt Strike, it is a commercially available uh, penetration testing tool that the source code was released and now available on underground uh, underground methods of getting it. And what we're finding is that there, this has been used many times as part of other attacks. And today, if you have XDR tools available to you, you should probably look for Cobalt Strike remnants within your organization, because most likely if they are there, you are either going to be attacked or you are under attack at this time. Um, and what we saw this year too is a new tool uh, was added as well to the mix. 
A major feature of the active adversary attacks, as well as some of the more automated attacks, is the use of these live off the land binaries. These native Windows components are leveraged by attackers to execute system commands. They bypass preset security features, download and execute remote malicious files, and move laterally across networks. This type of behavior can be dedicated and blocked in a number of ways. Malicious behavior using PowerShell and other scripting engines can be detected through monitoring of the Microsoft anti-malware software interface, AMSI. Behavioral analysis of the execution of these binaries through system calls or from a command line can also detect this use as well. And this is just a sample of what we've seen via Sophos Labs over the past year by a percentage of what we've seen used, uh, most frequently abused, uh, live off the land binaries. And there's a number of uh, there's a number of there a number of these out there right now. But of course, you've, you know, the live off land binaries are things that uh, a lot of the administrators use on a daily basis. And we always like to say, especially if you have an XDR type of service available to you, is that you also want to monitor these services and when they're being used as well. And so you can backtrack and then determine uh, who's using them, what permissions they have, and making sure that all administrators don't have access to all of these tools without any, any restrictions at all. And so what we're also seeing, too, that ransomware groups are also bringing their own executables with vulnerabilities. This has led to a rise of bring-your-own-driver uh, attacks, BYOD. Attackers utilize a legitimate signed driver with an exploitable vulnerability to gain access to the computer's operating system. In many cases, and this is what we've seen, is that the, the goal is to disable the EDR to evade detection. So we, as, we're, as the defenders are getting more advanced with how they're protecting their networks, the first thing that the detector will try to do is disable their defense. And we've seen this on a number of cases uh, with, with solutions being where they, they get administrative access to the council, they turn off protection, uh, or try to ways to evade it as well. So both, uh, we've seen this too with uh, the Avos Locker and the Blacklight have been used as, as a technique in this mechanism as well. So as we saw the fantastic uh, collapse of, of companies like FTX, as well as the bottoming out of a lot of uh, of, of crypto um, cryptocurrencies, the the lucrative or the, the money making option of actually crypto mining is really on the decline. Because in previous reports, this was actually very high, uh, where the attackers were leveraging the CPU of large server farms to do crypto mining. Uh, but what we're seeing this is is really on the decline now with the bottoming out of this. Of this as well, but while while miners are still popular, the profitability has decreased, uh, and of course, this has been due to the, the fluctuations of value of things of of uh, Monero and or XMR. Um, still, XMR is still among the most popular cryptocurrencies for miners because it is less traceable and doesn't require a specialized graphic card. And as a result, the botnet operators made less of an effort to grow their mining pools. Um, and we. And this is uh, just basically a byproduct of actually watching things like this over the years. And this is just a correlation uh, between the Monero miner detections and the price, as we saw the as uh, major price fluctuations from April to 2022. Now, this has been the mobile device attacks. This is a carryover from the previous year's report. And they're at the center of a burgeoning types of cybercrime. You know, uh, cyber, crime, cyber fraud, of course, is on the rise. In Southeast Asia, financial fraud rings have become an industry. Using fraudulent web and application developers, fake social profile builders, and scripted social engineering efforts uh, offers a, a new term, pig butchering <laughs> schemes, swindled users out of millions. Now, I have to confess, I actually had to do a little research on what a pig butchering scheme actually is, and it's, um, but we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, they've also formed, uh, also moved from dating apps to larger social network platforms like LinkedIn and Facebook. Like previous year, we actually had a dating app that uh, was leveraged uh, to uh, to uh, for a for a banking type of attack. But what basically a pig, pig, pig butcher, I'll dig a little bit into it just because if you're not familiar with it, it's a very um, it's it's a it's a very elaborate way for you to get money out of uh, people with large large bank accounts. So first of all, it's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, things that go on in the background to make it look legitimate where they'll they'll set up fake identities, fake companies, and they'll initiate the, the existing contact. Now, just like you would think, they're basically how you were pig butchering, you're fatting up the pig before you butcher it. This is what happens as well, is they win, it's an old, it's an old con where they win the trust of the target, they sign them up to an investment scheme and then show them really quickly the how fast they could turn around money in that fake account to prove that they're legitimate. And then what will happen is that they'll manipulate them to, to invest more money eventually cutting them off when they make a big a big deposit in their account. And they'll use their desperation to double down on their investment as well. 
and these are very these are done outside of a lot of jurisdictions where they know they cannot get caught and they get, they're very bold in how they actually uh, how they communicate with their victims as well so i always like to pick on the ios users um, because they always walk around with a sense of superiority, but they're not immune as well. So what we've discovered this past year is that the cyber fraudsters have found a way to bypass the Apple Store security policies so their targets can download their fraudulent financial applications. So iOS device users have become targets for malicious advertising campaigns. They are directed to download apps with hidden subscription fees, malware, or, or both. So that was a recap, really, of what we've seen in the previous year, what we're going to see for moving forward in 2023. But what we want to talk about now is how the legacy approaches that we have applied to our networks lead to poor security outcomes. And what I want to do is actually take you to what the kind of pain points that we're seeing right now with really all you know public sector networks, but this could apply to really to uh, to networks or users outside of the public sector as well. Is we've been doing security for a while, and lack of integration has been a big pain point with a lot of organizations that deploy a disparate number or disparate uh, solutions within the network where they have different vendors for firewall, antivirus, IPS, web filtering, email. And there doesn't seem to be any integration between the, between the two because security codes don't integrate with each other or wider IT organizations. Uh, it makes it really more complex. Uh, and for example, we actually did a recent survey of 1,600 IT directors on what influences their choice of vendor for IT security solutions. And the number one on the list was integration compatibility. So long has been the panacea of a single pane of glass to manage all of your security. And now we never seem to get there, but with uh, with open APIs and API calls, we're getting a little bit closer. But lack of integration has been a kind of a legacy issue uh, and leading to poor security outcomes. A manual process as well as IT teams spend valuable hours correlating events, logs, information to understand what is happening. And we've cons consistently been told is that half the team is time is spent correlating this data across the system to see what's going on. And you can see that that makes a direct impact. So this has always been a manual process. So there's a lot of time consuming uh, IT work that goes on behind the scenes to get this done as well. What we saw as a trend in 2021 and 2022 is really a shortage of IT skills, specifically when it comes to cybersecurity, because uh, it's a very specific learned task where it's you get a lot of experienced people uh, in this industry. This, it's a it's a specific set of skill set that goes beyond just your traditional um, IT admin, server administration type of IT skills. So it's really it and it, it, the shortage of skills. IT skills continue to be hard to recruit into the business. Um, and we actually did a study recently as well. 81% um, of IT pros say their ability to find and retain skilled IT security, uh, security professionals is a major challenge to their ability to deliver IT security. And what we're seeing is that in uh, the cybersecurity, uh, there's really, it's we consider it a humid challenge and is keeping the skill set, keeping them trained up, keeping them engaged. And, and I don't think that is going away anytime soon. Uh, noise overload. This has been a pain point for a lot of in, for for the security industry for years. But it really comes down to as well is your uh, and I think sims are probably the biggest uh, culprit of this as well. Is that they once people deploy a sim, they just want to um, uh, aggregate as many any logs they can and try to um, develop a, a, a data correlation for all the different devices, different. Um, different solutions they want to get into their SIM. And, and really, you're overloading your SOC. You're overloading your analysts. What you want to do is be able to really bubble up what's most important or what are the most important things that are happening on your network and have your administrators just respond to those. But the fact is we're getting noise overloaded. It comes to the fact that, I mean, it's really lack of integration is part of that as well. But two is that they're deploying a number of different devices and everything seems to be on high alert. And this is, you know, when everything's an alert, nothing can get acted upon it. So it's very important to actually have an overlay of actually making sure to identify what's the most important things of those alerts, what you need to uh, address in a timely fashion as well. And a reactive response. And, and this is something we're seeing to you. IT, we always seem, especially when it comes to cybersecurity, we're always on the back foot responding to threats once they've hit rather than getting on our front foot and being proactive with this as well. We have a lot of tools available to us to be more proactive. You know, XDR being a very, you know, a very 
popular tool and actually being more proactive and doing proactive threat hunting and getting ahead of the curve. But unfortunately, it's just the nature of the business. And I'm sure you're seeing this as well, is that if you take a look at your shortage of skill set and response of it, it really has to do with the fact is a lot of your organizations are uh, are doing multiple tasks they haven't done in the past, where your server administrator is your network administrator, is your firewall administrator, and you don't have a lot of staff or personnel and, and delineation of the control of those responses and you and you tend to be reactive and uh the first conversation i have with customers is how many times uh how many hours a week do you dedicate to being more proactive doing the threats threat hunting on your own and it's that seems to be more and more of a luxury with a lot of organizations even the larger organizations too Uh, multiple access needs. Uh, we we actually have seen this uh, for uh, really users are everywhere today. I mean, we this really expanded during the COVID pandemic, where everyone needed to work from home. And what I saw a lot of companies, organizations do is they really quickly pivoted to the work from home model. And what they did too is that they took that great security posture they had with their traditional network, brick and mortar, firewall, VPNs, and expanded it. And unfortunately, when they expanded it, it did it a little too rapidly. And they extended the network and extended the vulnerabilities of their network as well. Um, and data is everywhere now too. And so, so not only do your users are everywhere, but your data lives everywhere too. So, uh, and whether it be on-prem in the cloud, on devices, on their mobile devices, so you, so you don't need to, you know, I don't need to, I don't need me to tell you about the home working uh, as you, you've been living it. And on the cloud fund, we, rec we recently surveyed 1600 IT directors on their cloud initiatives and migrating more workloads and infrastructure to the cloud is becoming more important as well. And what I find interesting is that when I go into organizations and talk to them, I usually asked their an IT administrator, I said, do you have, are you running any type of applications in the cloud or you have any projects? And they'll usually, they'll maybe say one or two things, but a lot of times they'll say no, but then I go talk to like uh, an application developer or something uh, uh, somewhere else in the organization. And they're telling me about some really cool AI project they're running in the cloud. And, but guess what data they're using? They're actually using uh, data from their production network. So we want to make sure that as you extend your network to these places, you're aware of them, you're aware of where your data is going, because uh, I'm seeing more and more of that happen as well. Uh, distributed users. So remote access tools not designed for today's high level remote flexible working. This is kind of that, uh, you know, you want to take that uh, zero trust approach for your users going on the network. No longer can you just give them a carte blanche access when they're remote to like all networks via a, a traditional VPN, but you really want to lock it down, give them only access to specific applications within the network. And distributed users are now a thing we're going to have to live with. You know, this was a, a luxury in the past, but this is something that everyone now is, is working remote. And it, for the especially for the public sector, is that it really pivoted quickly. And we're seeing this uh, as, a, as a benefit for, for a lot of companies to roll this out where they don't need to be in the office five days a week. But when you're doing so, you want to make sure that same security posture that you apply to your brick and mortar and your network applies to those remote workers as well. And shifting control. So many departments leverage uh, you know, software as a service and cloud-based tools dependent, independent of their IT security. So teams are increasingly deploying solutions and services outside of IT. For example, uh, software as a service tools for HR, for marketing, for development, and, and meaning there are a lot of areas that require uh, cybersecurity overlay on top of that, making sure that you still are only giving access to, to those tools, to the departments, to the users that really need access to it as well. So with all of this, have we improved security? And that's what we really need to ask ourselves is, you know, have we improved our security out, uh, outcomes despite our investments and efforts here? Have we reduced the risk? Has we improved our ROI? And this is the legacy approach to security really leads to poor security outcomes. So what does this mean for defenders? So if I took everything we talked about uh, today from, from the threat reports that are out there in 2023, kind of what we, what our challenges are with, de with deploying a legacy approach, but I want to give you some practical things to go to take back now today. So the essential security recommendations for 2023, first of all, strategic defense, deploy a layered protection, combine technology with human expertise, and when you can get help with additional help and, and leverage things like an MBR, a managed detection response service, not to replace your existing solution, just to augment your existing solution, give you additional eyes and expertise in your organization, knowing all the challenges you have ahead of yourself as well. But from a tactical aspect of it, let's make sure to monitor and respond to alerts. Let's go back to basics, enforce, enforce uh, passwords, enforce multi-factor authentication, 
and let's secure remote access. No longer can you do the uh, IPsec uh, carte blanche access to uh, to networks from remote. You might want to consider a zero trust approach if you have not rolled that out already. Know what you have, where it is, and who has access to it. You know, backup, configure, and patch. And I can't emphasize that as much. And this is one stat that we can we continually monitor is between um, a when a vulnerability is known on a server to when it actually gets patched is 180 days, roughly. That time has not changed over the past nine years that we've kind of monitoring this behavior. And that's a big window of opportunity for attackers to take advantage of vulnerable systems that they know are vulnerable. And of course, you want to execute and protect your employees. I mean, I'm sorry, <laughs> execute. You want to educate and protect your employees. And this is done, it's a constant measure of doing this. There's a number of, number of tools and programs you can actually uh, leverage to educate and protect your employees. Um, but that being said, that's something to do is part of, should be part of your overall security measure too. We talked, uh, this is the report that I talked about, and a lot of the data can be found in here with a really deep dive on a lot of the, the additional trends that we talked about. You can download this report uh, at Sophos.com, and this is, all the data today was taken from the Sophos 2023 threat report. Thank you very much for your time. All right. Well, thank you so much, Matt. What a great presentation. Uh, for those of you out there that are wanting to dig into that report a little bit further, I'm just going to remind you that there is the, uh, the full report for you in the Handouts tab. Uh, so just click into that Handouts tab and you can snag that report. Uh, a perfect way to follow up on everything that we heard from Matt just now. Uh, Chris chiming in to say that they've been very happy with Sophos. I love that. I love hearing uh, high fives and kudos from all of you out there. That's, uh, that's Thank you for sharing that. Uh, and lots of, oh, more high fives coming in. I love it. You guys clearly enjoyed Matt's presentation. I did as well. I was laughing a little bit out loud at don't execute your employees, educate them. Uh, <laughs> that was a great presentation. Um, unfortunately, we're, we're going to let Matt go because we decided to go a little bit long on the presentation side of things because there was so much information to cover, which means we don't have time for the Q&A. But that said, we are making sure uh, that the Sophos team sees all of the questions coming in on live chat, uh, as well as uh, we will make sure that we send them over their way so that you will get responses back uh, as well. I am just uh, seeing some awesome comments coming in, some, some high fives from Michael, from Peter, uh, people who have experience with Sophos and, and want to let all of you out there know that they've had great experiences with them. So definitely worth uh, taking a look. And uh, one easy way that you can do that up on your screen there is just to click on the poll. So what additional information would you like about the SOFO solution? Go ahead and click on that data sheet, tech white paper, customer case study, any of those options. Just a great way to get some, some follow-up information uh, and, and join in the conversation there. Um, all right, well, I'm going to leave that poll up for a second because I want to give away some prizes. And uh, that's right, I said prizes is plural because we're actually going to give away two two prizes right now. So we have two $500 Amazon gift cards and you do need to be here live present uh, at the EcoCast here today with us in order to win, not just because, hey, that's, that's fun and exciting, but also because, hey, that's how you win the prizes. So our next winner of a $500 Amazon gift card today is Stephen Gadsby of Pennsylvania, Stephen Gadsby of Pennsylvania. And then our last winner of a $500 Amazon gift card is Tanner Myers of South Dakota, Tanner Myers of South Dakota. I'm going to review that whole list for you again. Uh, all three of our winners today, Gina Karasek of Michigan, Stephen Gadsby of Pennsylvania, and Tanner Myers of South Dakota. You have all won a $500 Amazon gift card. Uh, and I'm seeing uh, Michael saying that he uh, has, has downloaded that report, the PDF report, and says it's a must download. I would agree with you, Michael. I think, uh, and actually Matt mentioned this at the start of his presentation. This is the time of year for these sort of summative reviews of, of the year. And, uh, and we're starting to see those coming out from a lot of organizations. So if you haven't already started sort of surfing for the 2022 reports in summary that are coming out, uh, they'll, they'll really be over the next month or two that you'll see a lot of those coming in. And boy, are they interesting. Interesting. I sort of thought, you know, maybe if I every year I sort of think if I read one or two, it's enough. And I find myself reading as many as I can get my hands on because there's always something kind of new and interesting and a different perspective from each company out there. So please do spend some time surfing around and uh, you've got one right there for you in the handouts tab there. 
All right. Well, again, a reminder that we're going to be following up with everybody who uh, asked a question, and we will get that best question card out. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And hey, if you are with us on the Ecocast today and you've been thinking to yourself, man, it seems like fun to talk to Jess, you are not wrong. <laughs> Scott and David and I would absolutely love to talk to you. So shoot us a message at connect at actualtechmedia.com if you think you would like to present on an upcoming EgoCast, a MegaCast, a Summit, a webinar, PanelCast, DemoCast, you name it, we've got it. Come join us. Come hang out with us. Uh, and with that, on behalf of the Actual Tech Media team, I really want to thank both of our fascinating speakers that were here with us today from Rubric and from Sophos for making this EcoCast possible. But on that note, I also want to make sure that I thank all of you for attending and, and really for asking some great questions. I saw a lot of really fun comments. I love when people just post you know, little high fives along the way to the, the speaker, things that make you laugh, things that make you smile, or things that kind of tickle your brain a little bit. So thank you to all of you who participated and kind of brought that, uh, that engagement level up today. That was a lot of fun. Uh, and I hope that you kind of got some, some insight into some of the more specific risks and considerations, but also those exciting opportunities that are available to all of you in the public and education sector. Uh, you know, I've, as I said at the start, I really like, these to, like today when we get to dig into a, a sort of a specific area um, and especially something that bonds us together as a community. So I hope that all of you are inspired to keep doing some of your own research. Uh, make sure you've got those handouts before you go. And uh, speaking of research and, and preparation and knowledge seeking, uh, I why don't you sign up and come back and join us again this Thursday, that's February 9th at 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. We're going to be having a big old megacast look at all those vendors. We've got 12 different awesome presentations lined up for you. Uh, we're going to be talking in Cloud We Trust, ensuring trust and security in enterprise IT on the cloud. It is going to be such a great day. Just look at that jam-packed speaker list. They're uh, going to be a lot of fun. So be sure to register and come back and join us. That is Thursday, February 9th at 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. All right. Well, that's all I've got for you. So uh, I hope that I get to see you all again soon. And until then, I hope you all have an absolutely beautiful rest of your day.